first, you know, thank you to uh, David and Beth for the, all the great work that you've done and the presentation you've given us. I think there's probably a lot of questions from folks, which I, I hope we can um, try to answer here or, or later. Uh, we want to be respectful to everybody's time. We did set the meeting until uh, noon today. So if you need to drop off, feel free to. Uh, but if you want to stay on and, and type in questions in the chat box, uh, Joe and I will will certainly look at that and uh, provide context as well. So uh, Mayor Judd or or Dan Molly, do you guys want to say a few words? Dan, you are muted, sir. There. Okay. Sure. Say, I'm happy to, to, to jump right in, start. I'll, I'll be brief. I just want to say, I think this is really exciting stuff. Uh, the placemaking is what just fires me up the most. The idea of people getting started now and creating uh, spaces, new ways of seeing uh, and experiencing downtown Moorhead. I see a lot of opportunity areas. And um, really, I think that this is um, going to be a very fun project to work on. I like the 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 point about the the center mall district. I feel it's kind of a twofer. We know that the future of redevelopment is in these '70s era strip malls, the Kmart parking lots, the areas that are serviced with infrastructure and roads and water and sewer and all that kind of stuff. And we have one right in the middle of our downtown. So there's all sorts of opportunity. And so um, I'm looking forward to getting started and having the conversations that we need to to have to get there. Thanks, Dan. Uh, is I don't know if Mayor Judd had to drop off or if Mayor Judd is still on. Mayor, did you have any comments? I can't tell if the mayor is on or not right now. But um, again, feel free to, to type in questions. I think maybe as I wait for some to come in, um, Beth touched on it briefly about kind of building the implementation uh, certainly that is such a strong component of this. We don't want this plan just to sit. We want to take action with it. Uh, so certainly uh, we have some media kind of opportunities. We have um, the chamber that's very, very interested in doing some stuff that we'll see in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we also have uh, some ads and some different things. Um, we have a press release that's ready to go once we feel comfortable in, in kind of sharing this. Um, but there's opportunities to still build the momentum. Uh, I also view this as, as, a, as a very current plan that as students come to campus in, in future kind of years, we have opportunities to really uh, connect with our college students because that was such a key piece of this was uh, getting that raw just feedback from, from college students who, I will be honest, uh, didn't know what we had to offer. They just heard of downtown Fargo. Uh, are new of restaurants, but they didn't know of Thai Orchid in the mall and have uh, in such a great uh, restaurant that is, or the barbecue place in the mall. So things like that, that we, we need to continue to share our story uh, and celebrate. So uh, we're hopeful for, for continued conversations with that. And I don't see anything in the chat box yet, but uh, if people are, you know, Derek, timid to, to Derek, oh, go ahead. Uh, I'm unable. I'm unable to use the, it says the chat is disabled. This is Sarah. Um, oh, no. So I okay. don't know if anyone Thank else you. is having that problem. Okay. Well, uh, do you have a comment then? If, if people have comments, then maybe if there's a raise hand function within the uh, participants tab, then I can keep tabs on that to see if there's opportunities for people to have questions. But go ahead. Go ahead, Sarah. Sure. Yeah, I think there's a, I didn't try the raise hand, but um this plan's awesome. It's really exciting. I'm so um, grateful for all the phenomenal outreach. And I just want to say that um, I've done a lot of things with multimodal transportation and bikes and walkability. And I love that that is a mainstream concept because that was relegated to like hippie planning nerds for a number <laughs> of years. So um, that is fantastic that that's woven into this plan so strongly. And I think it's been adapted in other things in our um, community. So um, I just wanted to state that and, and uplift it and I'm really excited about it. Thank you. I'll mute much. myself now. <laughs> and Derek, can I just make a point about that? Yes, Sarah, please. thank you so much. Um, I was so pleasantly surprised to see how many people brought up walking, biking, uh, the fact that the buses don't run on Sunday, you know, 
it, it just was incredible. We weren't at, particularly at the early on of the process. We weren't asking specific questions about mobility. We just wanted to find out what people thought about downtown and their vision. And so many people brought it up. So yeah, it, it's not just a hippie con a planning concept anymore. Uh, there's definitely people, many people in Moorhead who are uh, thinking about how they get around. And this, this is David. I don't want to pull all the hippie out of this, uh, but um, one of the really interesting things when people drive through a downtown, rarely do they stop. They stop if they have a pre uh, a, a destination in mind. When people ride their bikes, clearly when they walk, but also when they ride their bikes, if they're going on a scooter, et cetera, they suddenly see a bakery or somebody selling coffee and boy, it sounds good. They stop, they shop, they participate in the place that they are passing through. And that is really good for downtown. Thank you. And I see we got some hands coming up. So I'm just going to go in the order that they came in. Uh, so first, uh, I'll just kind of maybe say the, the representation as well. So I think it's uh, uh, Alex Cusa with the Moorhead EDA. So Alex, do you have a question for us? Just unmute yourself and ask away. Yeah, thank you, Derek. Thank you to the two great uh, presenters. Um, I was just curious, as we know, the DNA of the area is very uh, college town kind of we have, I think, with Tri College, 50,000 on the Moorhead side. We have two big colleges plus a, a state school, mm -hmm. and we have the Spuds. Any ways of engaging, even in the design making, some of these brilliant minds? Because, you know, it would heighten the sense of agency or, and ownership of shaping downtown. And I was also curious when it comes to uh, attracting, retaining, and global talent, how much are we? designing again Moorhead in a way that when young families, when people are recruited to work in town, I mean, we have the RDOs, we have the John Deere's, we have the Microsoft. How do we make sure that those new hirees are, are so engaged in a way of, hey, when you moved in town, what made you choose to live on this side of the river or that side of the river? Because they come from bigger cities where maybe there's things we should take notes of, such as I heard engaging the river more or whatever, but so yeah student engagement and new hirees, new recruitees in the area engagement. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. And and maybe I'll touch on one real quick thing that I think is a, an opportunity for us uh, as we move forward, and that is to uh, continue to work on partnerships with uh, some of the top recru recruiters in the, in the area here. Uh, I know um, Sanford and others use uh, realtors in the area that are touring people around town. I think there's opportunities to have conversations with those folks that are doing it to understand the assets that we have, the momentum that's been building. Uh, so I do think that's an opportunity to still uh, showcase to these new recruits and to the talent coming in what Moorhead has to offer, as well as the, the great diversity that this community has. Again, I mentioned a place like Thai Orchid, a place like Everest Teak House and others, uh, such um, unique and uh, and culturally significant uh, establishments that we have in our area that should be celebrated through these community tours and showcase. So um, maybe I'll turn it over to Beth and David to answer some of the other stuff as well. David, you want to go ahead? Uh, I, university I, connection? It looks like David might be frozen. David, uh, can you frozen? go ahead? No, you're okay. good now. Okay, good. Thanks. Okay. So the first one, that is a great question. And once again, this country is experiencing in every region a growing labor shortage and jobs, people don't go where jobs are, jobs go where people are today. Uh, and retaining uh, those terrific kids who decided to, to go to, to college and study in, in Moorhead uh, and in the region is, is one of, is there are a number of job number ones, it's one of them. So what generally attracts and retains them? a place they can afford to live in a community they want to live. And a community they want to live is measured by how strong a sense of community does it offer them. And places to hang out, places to run into friends, places to have fun. And uh, again, think uh, coffee, beer, music, um, a lot of the stuff that, you know, Moorhead is, it's, it's all there. What will really cre help create the critical mass is getting more housing into downtown. More housing translates into more life on the street. More life on the street translates into a place that a lot of folks say, this is where I wanna spend my life and therefore make my economic life. Um, 
And if you have, if you want to ask more, please go right ahead. Uh, well, but I think that's the, the formula. Well, I was going to say too, you know, it is really unique for you to have two great colleges right outside of downtown, um, but they don't feel like they're right outside of downtown. They feel like they're far away. It's hard to figure out um, a safe way to bike and walk and take the bus. Um, and so uh, part of, I think, what we were looking at is how do you um, minimize that perceived gap between uh, Concordia, Concordia, MSUM, and downtown? And one thing is to get more you know, housing that students can live in in downtown, but the other is to kind of like fix the ways that they get in and out of downtown. Um, eighth is a really big part of that. Uh, the kind of the paved kind of multimodal path does not necessarily feel like you should be biking on it. And just some of those things could be really great improvements. Early on in the process, we also talked about um, great rides coming uh, into Moorhead and and trying to uh, kind of create the model that they did in Fargo, where it really is about getting students um, in and around and then everyone else benefits. So there are some of these like really big kind of overarching trends that are going to help, but there's also these little kind of surgical improvements that could really um, aid uh, that connection too. I'm, I'm going to add one more note very quickly. This is no pun intended, a two way street so that Definitely. it is the same thing, the same things that will encourage students to want to stay in Moorhead after they finish college or graduate school, or whatever, are the things that are going to make them want to come to Moorhead to go to school in the first place. So uh, the city, the, the larger community, uh, these institutions share fundamentally share common goals. And I, if I could add one thing, and my understanding is that those interests are also in a lot of ways, the same as folks that are 55 or older that Ooh, they're yes. looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's two demographics that are that are growing, that are emerging, that are that are looking for a, for a same same sort of uh, place, yeah. which is a real opportunity. And so and I'm glad Beth brought up um, what's happening on the North Dakota side of the river with NDSU's um, Renaissance Hall, where there's art and architecture a potato throw away in the business school at Barry Hall and some of the excitement that's happening there as well, because, you know, we are two cities, but in a lot of ways, the downtowns do relate to each other. And I know the downtown plan there uh, has an entire section called two cities, one downtown. I'm not saying that, that there's any time like co-option here, but we have definite opportunities to be good, friendly, happy neighbors, you know? Absolutely. Thanks, Dan. And and Carrie, I did see your question in the in the chat box. Um, I'm going to let uh, Council Member Larry Selgevold ask his question first, and then maybe we'll hit uh, Carrie's question in the chat box. So, uh, City Council Member Larry Selgevold. Oh, thank you. Uh, I found it interest uh, being a baby boomer when you said the uh, in the demographics, the household with no children is a growing market. And that's where exactly I'm at. I would like to downsize and do that. But uh, I've also lived long enough where I've seen things built, torn down, built, rebuilt. So what happens when the baby boomers like myself uh, move on and, and die away? And then now there's not as much market as there used to be. Is there a, is there a crystal ball? Is there a vision that happens when all the baby boomers are gone? Um. I can jump in. Is anybody else? Um, Dan or somebody, do you want to jump in? I can respond, but. No, you're the master. Take this I'm one. Master, oh, help. Okay. Uh, yep, I'll tell you what, I'm, and I'm going to make this a little bit about competition here. The suburban communities that are doing best are those that are developing new downtowns. There are a lot of suburbs out there uh, basically developing, uh, Beth and I are working in one just at, uh, south of Minneapolis that are creating new walkable downtowns, corridors, uh, places that folks who live in single family houses can walk too quickly so they can share that sense of amenity. And believe me, it is those neighborhoods that are holding their values best in our world today. And I say, I would strongly suggest that that trend will become, well, the, that reality will become truer as we go forward. Does that, does that get to your question? There are other things too. There are, you know, accessory dwelling units and a whole series of strategies that probably belong in a follow-up study rather than a quick comment here. But, um, but, but essentially a great downtown does wonderful things for nearby neighborhoods. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I want to just, I'll state maybe Carrie Winterstein's question here and Carrie's with the Arts and Culture Commission. Uh, her question is, what should artists, art organizations, and art associations be doing now to prepare to take advantage of development opportunities uh, as they begin to arise? So Beth or David, yeah. do you have any comments on that? I can start with that. And you know, maybe what I'll do, if people are still looking at the presentation screen, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so we can all see each other's faces a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I can always pull it up if we need to. So um, there's a lot, Carrie, there's so many wonderful examples of uh, cities that are really prioritizing art. You know, my, um, uh, much of my career I spent at the city of Minneapolis as a planner when and one of my good friends is the art and culture, uh, 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 the public art administrator. So I think one of the first things is making sure that artists are in the beginning discussions about uh, how city funds are used for development and uh, public investments um, in the right of way so that um, art isn't an afterthought. Uh, a lot of people have heard about plop art. Um, I think it's so much better if um, art, for example, in infrastructure, if you have an artist in the design process for infrastructure, uh, the artist, it doesn't have to cost any more money on a project because maybe you're already designing uh, 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 street grates. Now an artist can design them with the same type of materials, but do it up front versus after the fact. Uh, bike, uh, uh, bike racks, same thing, um, other art uh, related to lighting. So what I would say is that um, the fact that you have an arts and culture plan is a big first step. The fact that you have a commission is an even bigger step. But what you need to make sure is that you are constantly advocating for art representation at the beginning of a process rather than an afterthought at the end. Um, and this plan can maybe help you figure out your own work plan in some ways about how to um, how to get into those conversations and and obviously uh, Kim is going to be a big part and conduit at the city to to get you into those discussions. Thanks Beth and I, I'll say too um, for those that are on the, the call I mean this is this is kind of new and I know a lot of us are virtual and a lot of different things but uh, Andrew Nielsen at the at the Moorhead Center Mall the new general manager for well, I guess he's been there for a few months now maybe even a year um, but he's done some great work and just recently, I think even this morning announced a, a mural that will be uh, going inside as well. So there's some new art kind of uh, pieces going up. So I think the more we can get engaged, I think uh, carry uh, dialogue between uh, projects that are going on. I think most developers are willing to have some type of art uh, uh, accommodation in a, in a project. It just has to make sense. And I think we got to capture it early on, especially if it's... Um, if there's public kind of participation in this as well. Um, that being said, I'm going to uh, let uh, City Council Member Deb White uh, answer, uh, ask her question. Thanks, Derek. First, I just want to say to how much I value all of the great work that went into this, in particular, that the high level of community engagement. And I think that really is reflected in, in the final product. Um, and I agree that I think that the timing of this is is great because you know we've continued to see growth in our downtown during the pandemic, which I think might surprise people. But this allows us to be able to have that planned and coordinated growth that really will move us to where we want to go. Um, and I think it, it it's going to give us that light at the end of the tunnel. People are, you know, COVID weary and um, being able to see some exciting things uh, that are going to be happening in our downtown will I think really. Um, be a, a nice, you know, ray of sunshine. My my question has to do with again, what more could we be doing um, in that short term, in the next six months, to really make sure that we hit the ground running and create a lot of excitement and get the word out? Um, is there, in terms of process, is there like a subgroup that is just that's their main priority? Are there ways that the council can help with that? And then, this is directed to our city manager. I know we're looking at. Um, outdoor activation events this winter. Is there a way that we could tie in some of that to kind of give people a, an idea of that this is a taste of things to come, you know, come and do these things that we are organizing for downtown and this is just the beginning of other great things. So just wanted to throw that out there. I'll, I'll maybe touch on it briefly. I think from the the kind of announcement and how we kind of build the, the momentum early on in the plan is, uh, is certainly important. I think, um, I think there's going to be different means that we're going to have to and different channels that we'll have to get through, right? But 
I think the good part is a lot of people were, were understanding of when we are going to be announcing this plan. So uh, a lot of the media channels have already reached out to me. They're, they're aware of when we're kind of uh, looking to, to progress this. Uh, so a lot of those things are lined up. So that'll be a really nice piece is that we're going to be hitting the, the radio, the TV, the, the social media stuff through a lot of different channels early on. So I'm excited about that. Um, I think there's still opportunities though, to, to take it to the next level. So we haven't really talked about this, but maybe there is opportunities to create just a small, uh, task force. That's kind of a joint thing, even between DMI, Moorhead business association, the city about how we just continue to implement and, and accomplish some of these things as well, because there's a lot of different entities. Um, maybe there's some representation that we can all get together to make sure that we accomplish this as well. Dan, um, do you have thoughts? Yeah, yeah, and I'll try to keep them brief. The the way Deb asks questions, I could go on and on and on because <laughs> they're so loaded with good stuff. Um, the one one thing that we have going for us is this is a I think the way I see it, like a five to ten year plan. It's not one of these plans that just has all this just unrealistic stuff that we just aspire to. So it it really does start off with things that we could do today. So that's really super. The other is it's a community engaged process. So we've got the public involved. It's less about the plan and more of the process. And so if we just kind of keep opportunities for those conversations happening as we go, I think leading into our comprehensive planning process that just leads right in because we're going to be having these conversations around the community. And this plan just supports that larger community plan. So we have an opportunity there. And then the last thing that I would say is that you know, we have this way, the example I use is like, you know, you meet, you know, you talk about going out to a for a cup of coffee with a friend and before you know it, it's got, you know, all kinds of spice and seasonings on it. And then it turns into a 32 ounce coffee and you're like, I'm not happy. It's not going, I'm not, that's too much. I'm not doing it. And so you just missed out on the opportunity to have a nice cup of coffee. And so maybe starting out is just these little things, these little pop-ups. We have a friend, Steve French. He's like, why aren't we selling bait on the river? Can somebody just open a little spot where we can get bait? I mean, that's so great, you know, and that's not hard to do. And so maybe kind of being permission giving, working together on alternatives rather than obstacles, those little those little steps uh, maybe create those things that turn into something bigger. Well, and Dan and Deb, I just want to add to that, that pro proactivity is a huge part of this. Like, what are you going to do? What barriers can you remove? How do you get the bait shop right there? But also, Deb, it's just making sure that that the plan itself is constantly at the forefront of people's minds so that the council doesn't make a decision that can um, uh, basically preempt a lot of the, the recommendations. So you don't lose an opportunity in the future, let's say. Great. Um, I know there's a couple comments in the chat box here. So I know Jill, I, I want to just get them on the record, I think for the recording purposes. So Jill's is, uh, Jill's with, Jill Abbott is with Concordia, and I'll just read this for the record. Uh, it states, another strength of this plan is that we are focused on structures, brick and mortar, uh, can serve people as opposed to expecting people to get excited about building structures that do not always foster that source of connection or recognize how spaces and places can serve multiple purposes, such as affordable housing, retail, public art, green space, I think this element of the plan will be attractive to all ages and will serve both economic and human development needs. Um, so thanks for that uh, statement, Jill. And I, I know Tim just put this in, Tim, Tim Beaton uh, with FM Mary Foundation recently retired. Uh, it states, uh, how does the success or failure of the diversion project impact this planning? And I know um, we got some engineers on the call and, and others, maybe I'll just, uh, make a blanket statement early on, but the biggest advantage that Moorhead has to the river is that we are on higher ground. So the fact is that we aren't reliant upon a lot of the flood protection um, needs of our surrounding regions. So that is uh, a strength that, that I think our city manager, Dan Molly and others have continued to say, this is where our, our opportunities are is to celebrate the river. River keepers and others, great organizations are, are trying to do that. Moorhead can be that catalyst and it's not a, a negative against Fargo, but ultimately the flood protection needs that they had to create the wall that you see through downtown, we don't need in Moorhead. So the the visual aesthetic to the, the river, the peer access to it is so much different um, where I think uh, we can value that in a much bigger way. So I know, Dan, you feel strongly about this. Do you want to add anything to that? 
Uh, certainly. Um, so this, this to me comes right down to resilience. It's easy, you know, we know the storms are getting worse, the water's getting higher. And so, but we need to create, which so we got to maintain healthy and safe communities, but we also want them to be places where people are. And that diversion project is exactly that. The one thing that's so interesting to me is that it's going to control the amount of water that flows through town. So on both sides of the river, we know where the water is going to be. So we're able to plan along that river. We talk about, you know, building an aquatic center and different things. We'll never find a better aquatic center than that river. I mean, it comes, I mean, it's right at the core of who we are. So, uh, you know, the possibilities are really great. And so that was when David started and said, this is the right time to do this. My mind went right there too, along the, along the planning for the river, because that diversion project, which is anticipated to bring in six to 800 people, by the way, and is going to have a major impact. If we want to take lessons, we could look to Boston when they did the big dig, what happened, how you can do it wrong and how you can do it right. And it's still walkable and it still works. But that's kind of the impact of a, of a very large public works project like this. And so as we talk about the right time, we're in a position with a plan where we can ready set for that project to be complete in 10 years or right. less. I mean, you know, well, it's a thanks. big impact, right? And Bob, uh, very yeah, thanks, just, Bob. That's the that's the okay. That's that, good. That's, that's, <laughs> that's what I was going to put on public record. We got the city engineer Bob Zimmerman saying we we covered it well. So um, I, I feel like that's a that's a good thing. Um, I I don't see anything in the chat box or any other raised hands. I know we're getting close on time, but I did see at one point uh, Mayor Judd did have his hands up. So I I, I wanted to uh, provide. Mayor Judd, if he is available to, to say a few things, and then maybe we can uh, uh, work to put a close on this after his statements. Mayor Judd, are you available? And it looks, feel free to interrupt me, Mayor Judd, if you, if you are able to get on. But I, um, again, maybe just to kind of put a bow on this, I, I really appreciate everybody's time here this morning. Um, I think this is just a, a really exciting time for our community. Um, I look back three years ago when I started with DMI and it, it really became a, a hope and a, a prayer, I think, in a lot of sense to, to see some of the accomplishments that we've already uh, had. Uh, so I'm very, very blessed to see that we've built uh, confidence within our, our development community. We've uh, we've broke, broken down a lot of barriers and historical perception that has plagued Moorhead, I'll just say, over the last 20 years. And that's a credit to city staff, um, city leadership, the electeds, uh, my organization and other boards that, that serve the city. That business certainty and, and just the energy and the momentum that we've been able to carry over the last number of years is, is truly evident. I mean, go up and down the streets of downtown and you see the projects, you see the reinvestments, you see new businesses popping up. And even during this pandemic, we have new things happening. Um, we have businesses that, yes, some are struggling, but we have some that are doing extremely, extremely well. Uh, so we, talking about the resiliency and how we can kind of build on, on, on kind of energy, I think this plan provides this uh, this vision, this this um, consistency that we can use when we're talking with developers, when we're when we're working to build partnerships with our local universities or realtor markets and recruiters, et cetera. So I'm uh, I'm extremely grateful to uh, the city, uh, to my my board leadership, and ultimately to the folks at Stantec. Um, uh, Peggy Harder is not with us here today. She started working uh, for a group that's kind of doing some stuff with the diversion. But Peggy Harder was kind of our first project lead, uh, did a fantastic job. Beth Elliott has always been a part of the process and Beth has done a phenomenal job. Uh, Joe uh, and those support roles have been fantastic. And then ultimately David Dixon with uh, just some great knowledge and um, and context to kind of help us form a lot of these ideas, the experiences that uh, that David brings is is truly incredible. So, I'm I'm proud of the work that we've done. I'm looking forward to uh, presenting it to EDA next week Monday, uh, presenting it to my board on Monday night, uh, and then ultimately building towards City Council on the 14th and and making this a, a reality so we can start laying the foundation for for great work for years to come. So, um, with that, uh, Dan, Beth, David, any closing statements that you want to share? 
I just want to say that it's been wonderful to work with you. Um, we are going to continue our relationship in, in wonderful ways, but I do want to recognize that we had a team of consultants that made this happen besides Stantec. You know, the Kilbourne Group really um, uh, offered a lot of their development expertise, market expertise throughout the process. Uh, Confluence uh, supported much of the open space design work and Folkways, uh, Joe and his team uh, kind of really being creative about engagement and activation. So I just want to thank everybody. You've been so great to work with, and we're really glad that we um, are at this point with you. I'll add just a, a quick postscript. Um, I would say that um, sadly, Beth and I and some of our colleagues sometimes have the, the opportunity to work with communities that don't make as much progress uh, as I'm sure you're going to make. Uh, and the difference is leadership, local leadership. Uh, there are lots of opportunities coming toward Moorhead, toward downtown. Uh, they uh, will not uh, happen, the, the benefits will not happen automatically. They happen because you're engaged. You have a downtown organization. You've got a city manager who's clearly been engaged. City council members show up for conversations like this and, and many others. And that makes a fundamental difference. And uh, one of the reasons this has been such a pleasure for us is just to see how engaged you are. And we've learned a lot from you. So thank you. And Derek, you've gone silent. Oh, sorry, I was muted there. Um, and I just wanted to say then for the record in the chat box, uh, Mayor Jonathan Judd said thank you to the community for their active engagement and valuable input. So uh, thank you, Mayor Judd, for those comments. And um, as always, I'm an open book, so feel free if you have other questions or comments as we're continuing, uh, feel free to reach out to me and, and we'll, we'll gladly have conversations as we move forward. So I hope everybody has a great uh, rest of their day and a great weekend, and uh, we will certainly be in touch. Thank you all.